Would you mind closing that door? Thank you very much. Hi, Garth. Hi, Amelia. Hello. Y'all doing okay? Hanging in there. How are you? Jan shared with me your your days, Amelia. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, let's see. Is everyone ready? And you just let me know. Uh, good evening. It's December 15th of uh, 2020. Before we open our meeting, Council Member Garth Hens is going to offer a word of prayer. Mm. Father, we push pause in the day. We acknowledge that you are good, that you are king, that you are holy, that there's no one like you. We are grateful that you are a healer, and we ask that you would come and that you would bring uh, some healing over CV even now that you would remove some of the pain that he's in and the discomfort that he's in. Father, we ask that you give us favor and wisdom to know what directions to take, what decisions to make. We want to bring a smile to your face in the way that we care for our citizens as best we can as we've been entrusted. And so we give you this time. Come and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Garth. I now call our meeting of December 15th, 2020 to order. Would you please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So beginning our evening, we're going to go into an executive session uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551-074. It is now 5.31 p.m., uh, and uh, those of you that are here that want to remain, City Secretary is going to show you where you can wait, and so uh, I believe uh, we will have our City Manager and our City Attorney uh, remain, please. Good. So let's let Mr. Davis, <laughs> our Mr. Davis, come on up <laughs> and let you uh, uh, start this conversation for us, please. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I, 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 I just can't help myself. Thank you very much, Mayor, of uh, Council Members. Um, uh, it's been my very great pleasure, I, I guess, for the better part of 20 years to. Uh, have worked on uh, many different uh, legal matters uh, with Robert Davis and the Flowers Davis uh, Law Firm um, on matters from litigation to open meetings to Public Information Act to employment law um, and just about everything in between. Um, I, I guess I could say I've had a front row seat to see the good work that they do. Um, I, I guess Robert, it'd probably be safe to say there's there are not many counties in East Texas that y'all haven't at some point uh, assisted, uh, probably in the neighborhood of 45 or so, uh, a number of municipalities. Uh, the Flowers Davis firm, I think, uh, currently uh, represents the city of Bullard and uh, also maybe Big Sandy, Sandy. Big Sandy um, and assists uh, Greg, Greg County, I guess, at this time, really, with, with their civil uh, needs in, in general. Um, uh, they have the capability uh, to really, from soup to nuts, uh, from, from everything from Public Information Act, Open Meetings Act, uh, matters all the way to uh, municipal prosecution, um, which is, which is a, a, a very good thing uh, because we, of course, cover all, all those matters and everything um, in between. In the last several years, uh, the Flowers Davis firm has actually worked with the city on several matters. 
Uh, Robert's firm helped us with a dispute with AT&T. Uh, there was a, a, a somewhat difficult situation. Um, we were dealing with a captured council out of Denver, Colorado, and uh, you know, a big firm and really bearing me in, in paperwork. And so Robert, I appreciate very much, stepped in um, and uh, rolled up all that paper and swatted AT&T across the nose. Um, and and uh, in, in fine fashion, matter of fact, we, we, we went on a dispositive motion against one of the biggest corporations in America, um, and they did not appeal it because they didn't want to appeal it. Uh, they didn't want, want uh, that to become law across the board, and so I, I think, and so did a fantastic job on that just recently. Uh, this firm also, another partner in the firm, Mitch Beard has helped us with uh, some collection matters on some delinquent hoteliers. Uh, and a very good effect, and so now that that those two entities, those two hotels, are, are caught up, and uh, they're having to pay uh, our legal fees. Uh, so I give those as two uh, two good examples. Um, I could go, you know me. I could go on and on, and I will go on and on. Well, one of the main things I think we need to just uh, remind ourselves of is that the reason we were interested in their firm uh, was because they were sort of turnkey and mm -hmm. could do all of the things that, that the unique position we have here um, could handle. Absolutely. Um, and I've, I've visited with with Robert about that, that, you know, we, we do have things any given day. It's, it's anything from environmental matters to litigation matters to municipal court matters, employment matters, um, all the way across the board. And um, uh, Flowers Davis firm, gosh, Robert, I guess y'all have what over 20, 20 attorneys. Yeah, 20 attorneys, yeah. And um, uh, there's a whole, whole portion of the firm that this that's they're as good as they come when it comes to um, real estate matters, um, and I think will be able to to help us greatly with with zoning issues and and you know real estate matters come up constantly for us. So really across the board, I do. I've seen firsthand, I believe they'd be just turnkey for what we need during this interim period. Right. We had another question about the timing. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be able, is there going to be able to be a little bit of, of overlap? We, I, I, uh, poor Robert, um, I've already talked to him a little bit about a few matters that we would like to, to maybe start in on before the first, actually. Um, and That's good. You know, one of we have you know several things going well a lot really going on <laughs> in a lot of areas, uh, but with the with the airport and some things that, that we see in the future with that that flight school that are so very exciting, um, and we're pretty far down the road on our agreement there. But I, I do want to make sure that that's seamless and that we we get that uh, squared away. Uh, we have uh, some other issues on some of the economic development th matters that I think we. I would like to start in immediately on, and then just in general, um, possibly if, if, if Robert or, or uh, somebody with his firm might be able to spend a little time with us for an afternoon or a morning mm -hmm. or so um, over the next couple of weeks, that would be great just to kind of talk about the matters that are really kind of kind of hanging fire for us right now. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bolden, do you have any questions for either gentleman? Well, uh, just one question, and, and this is interim position, right? Yes, sir. Is there days and times frames that he's going to be here full time? Have you discussed that with him? Well, we haven't. We, you know, the, we would we would uh, get a little deeper into that, uh, you know, if, and I guess to back up a little bit, our, the way our charter reads is that the, the council appoints for an indefinite term uh, the, the, the city uh, attorney, and, and that's at will. Uh, so it's not for a set time. Um, with regard to you know how we would manage those things, we talked some about that, um, and I, I don't want to. I'll certainly step to the side and let Robert address these things because I'm sure he could do a far better job than I can. But I think if we had a, a council meeting, um, or if we had uh, say a committee meeting, um, if we had a, a, a particular matter that we would need boots on the ground, we would need somebody here. Um, I think that. We would be able to, to to work through those those issues and and have somebody actually here, but try to do as much as we could through right. Zoom and through uh, electronic right. communication. All right, thank you. Good question, yes, sir. Um, Garth. 
I'm excited and looking forward to it. I, I'm grateful to have somebody so close within 90 minutes, but no, no question, questions or any pressing concerns. Okay, Jay. I, I don't have any particular questions now. I'm, I'm confident in, in our Mr. Davis's assessment. <laughs> And Amelia. No, Mayor, no questions from me. I'm, I'm also um, excited and, and grateful that we have somebody so close and so qualified to take care of us while we find somebody else. Yeah. Thank I, you. I would say, Council Member Fisher, your ears should burn. Um, I was visiting with Mr. Davis earlier, and uh, he speaks ex extremely highly of, of your firm. And uh, I think that maybe y'all have worked on some matters together in the past. We, we've had a little bit of, of overlap, and I've always heard really good things, um, particularly coming out of my dad's mouth about you guys, and that is a rare <laughs> thing. So <laughs> well, that means something. I'm honored to say that. I, I think very highly of you guys. I, I think, Amelia, that's, that's the acid test. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Yeah, and, and I, I, I guess I'll, I'll end with this. Certainly, any other questions, and I'll step to the side and, and let Robert uh, say a quick word. Well, first of all, we're not kin folks. Um, I wish we were, because he's a, he's a very successful attorney. Um, but just absolutely um, on top of his game in every way. Never have I seen a situation whether it was going into a courtroom on a very serious matter, and we've taken on some pretty serious matters. Um, that he wasn't absolutely prepared and didn't represent whatever entity it was to the, to the greatest and finest extent, I think, that, that one could hope for. Um, he is honest as the day is long um, and just a flat-out good guy. And, uh, you know, every now and then you run across a firm or an attorney that might get a little heavy-handed on whatever it might be, including Billy. Uh, on occasion, Robert is so honest, and everybody I have dealt with over these years in his firm has, has been just cut out of that same cloth. And so I, 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 would not, I would not make this recommendation if I did not absolutely believe that this is the best interim solution for the city of Nacogdoches. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis? Thank you, Mayor, Council. Yes. yes. Um, we're excited about the opportunity, and I, I can't say enough good things about Jeff. And I know that losing him is going to be hard for the city, but um, this county is going to have a district court judge who's going to excel in every way. And, uh, you know, when people, especially attorneys, look at communities, they look at your district court judges and to see who they are and see how fair they are and how honest they are and how honorable. And uh, with Jeff on your bench, I think it's a real attractive feature for this community and this county. I really do. And uh, I'm honored that Jeff would ask. And, uh, and we want to do everything that we can possibly do to get y'all through this interim period while y'all look for a replacement. And, uh, and even after that, if, there's, if the replacement needs help and assistance on things that we've handled and haven't completed, then we're happy to do it. And we're down here a lot for the county anyway. So I had planned on coming to every city council uh, meeting that I possibly could. Um, so if y'all have any questions, I'll certainly field them. Uh, anybody have a question? No? no. Looking okay. I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you, Mayor. Uh, and we really appreciate you your coming, making this trip. It's, really, it's kind of important to... To see, it face is to important face. You're a real person. To, uh, it is important to see people and get a, a feel for each other. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I appreciate well, it. And Amelia, please say hello to your father for me. <laughs> yes, sir, I will. Thank oh, you. goodness. Um, okay, so what we are going to, thank you very much. Yes, what we are going to need to do is uh, our, a council member needs to make a motion uh, to appoint, um, is it Davis and Fla Flowers and Davis? Flowers and Davis um, as our inter, our city attorney indefinitely. What word did you use? Well, I, I think I think that you know once we come out, we will be out of executive session. Uh, I think someone is so inclined, they can certainly make a, a, a motion to appoint the law firm of Flowers and Davis uh, to perform the duties, interim, the, well, duties of, of uh, city, city attorney. attorney. 
somebody got that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> I like to get all this out of the way before we go back on live, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any other discussion before we go back into our regular session? Mario, is there anything you needed to add? No, ma'am. Okay. So. I'll wait till everybody gets back in before we do this. <clears throat> Yeah, we're, we're going to wait until they get in and get seated. Policeman is standing outside. Oh, really? <laughs> cold. Doesn't stand out yeah. the cold any longer than he needs to. Okay. Uh, so, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551-074, uh, it is still December 15th of 2020. It is 5.45 p.m. Council has returned from executive session. Uh, after, their, uh, after discussing uh, matters uh, relating to um, interim city attorney and related legal services. I move that we appoint Flowers and Davis as our interim city attorney. Second. Okay, moved and seconded that we appoint Flowers and Davis Law Firm as our interim uh, city attorney. Uh, if no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, unanimously pass. Thank you so much. Thank and you. be safe driving back. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it very much. Uh, so agenda item number five is a, uh, a short work session. We are going to receive a demonstration of the NAC 311 application uh, used for citizen input and work order processing. And I believe we're going to have Steve Bartlett this evening. We haven't seen you in a little while. Mayor Council, Steve Bartlett. Yes, I was much younger last time I was here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you. So we're going to try to navigate through this. Is my PowerPoint up? Be paying attention. So I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about uh, a new uh, citizen engagement item that we have called NAC 311. So this is really an engagement platform that allows us to both obtain and get comments and track those comments from citizens. Um, this is a new way to do it. As you guys know, we get a lot of those over the phone or in the parking lot. And so this is going to give us a way to allow them digitally uh, to communicate with us. It's available as an app for both an Android phone or a uh, iOS operating an Apple phone as well as a Windows-based application of which we use one for a, a background panel I'll show you in a minute. Um, we think cell phones will be our primary portal for communicating with the public just because people are mobile and they can see things and so we think this is a great way to have a cell phone app. It does work with the GPS module in their phone, which can help locate where they are on a map if they don't know their address, or if they uh, do have an address and they're not at that location, they can certainly do that, and I'll show you that as well in a moment. Um, the citizens will also now receive email updates as to the progress of their request or their question or their problem, and also that it's been resolved or finished. So we'll be able to communicate much better that way. So not only is this a good way to engage our citizens and get feedback, but it's creating an internal work order system for us. We've had other work order systems, uh, and actually different ones. Public Works has had one that was created in-house that you've seen uh, for Kerry Walker, and others have had paper ones. So this basically creates a new uh, work order system that allows us to streamline all of our workflows and really reduce, uh, uh, reduce our wasted time and get our resources allocated in the right place. Um, 
It allows us to deploy crews for repair, investigate code enforcement actions, and things that, that we really need to do in a timely fashion. This also, we think, will get us a resolution to citizens' problems faster than we're currently doing now. And, and I kind of tell this story, um, one of you sees a pothole on a street, or a citizen tells you about a pothole on a street, you call the city manager's office, they call me, I call Kerry, he calls Boyd, he goes to the patch truck and they go out and fix it. And then the next day, we see each other in the parking lot and you say, how about that pothole, did it get fixed? And I'm like, I don't know. And so we go back through that sequence, back and forth and back and forth. And, and we've done that together. And we actually spend a lot of time and effort doing that. So this is now going to allow us to short circuit all that and also have a console you can use, I can use, and the citizen can use to see that these things are done. So really, uh, other big advantage is management can track these. So I'm able to look, or all of us as managers or directors can look at our departments and see what's going on, what work orders are done, which ones are completed. Uh, and that's a, a great way for us to be able to keep track. The third item that I think is a really a benefit uh, when I show you this is we're going to get some unparalleled historical data. So you remember when we do our street update every year with you, I show you, one of the things I show you is the heat map for potholes. Remember our pothole truck takes track of every single pothole they fix and we're able to plot those and say, boy, this street is bad and this street's not so bad and it helps us prioritize that. This is going to give us that kind of data after we accumulate it for a little bit on water line repairs and sewer leaks and trail problems and everything you can think of. We're going to be able to harvest this data and really use it for better budget planning and really better large project capital improvement planning. So we'll have some good basis other than, gee, we feel like that's a bad sewer line. I think we fixed it a bunch of times over the last 10 years. We'll be able to harvest that data and help it. So we've actually been operating for um, uh, several months using this, test driving it, found some humps and bumps, and we've been working to correct them. It's been live, believe it or not, but we haven't told the public about it much. Tonight, they're being told about it, as well as you. Uh, but we've processed, we had 560 work orders that were processed when I wrote this. We're now, you know, over 600 work orders. So we're using it internally as our work order system. But when a citizen calls me now and says, I've got a pothole on the street or a water line leak here, I literally do this while I'm sitting there on the phone with them and it's off and gone. So we're actually using it for real life. We just haven't taught the public yet how to use it. So that's our certainly our next step. We're going to begin outreach to the public in January and actually that probably starts tonight. KTRE uh, is doing a, a spot tonight on it. And so we'll probably have lots of downloads by in the morning and we're looking <laughs> forward to that. So we're anxious to see now with the public activated on this uh, how it works. So. Uh, initially, this cost $15,000, a uh, little over $15,000, and there's a $11,600 annual renewable fee. So you will see that in our budgets in the future. It's not a whole lot of money for what we think is the benefit, both on the staff side and this side. So let me do a demonstration. You're going to help me fire up. So I'm going to do, um, there we go. See, he's, I'd be lost if he wasn't here. Thank you so much. <laughs> so whether it's on your phone or whether it's on your computer, this is the screen you see. And uh, Garth and Amelia, can you see that? I see their heads nodding. Okay, they're nodding. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is not just uh, what we process citizen comments and engagement with, but this is a screen that does everything from connect you to Channel 21, show you, uh, connect you to our webpage for jobs. Uh, it goes how to pay your utility bills. So this is a total citizen page to go to. It'll link to the CVB for entertainment. So it's a great place to be, and now they'll have it on their phone. But if you look at the bottom, uh, we've added a section down here. There we go. It says request. So, again, whether you're on Windows-based or whether you are on a phone-based, these screens all look the same, just squished a little bit. So I'm, I can run you through all the menus, but I know you're short on time tonight. So I'll run you through one example of how to do it. And then if you want to go back in detail, you just bring me back and we'll, and we'll do that. So uh, it's basically real. I'm sorry, I'm looking through my trifocals. You know that. So uh, we're going to select a report type, and that brings us up to some categories that are general. And you can see we're already kind of trying to direct them into pods where uh, individual departments will take care of things. So we're trying to, to get them in the right area the first time so that their requests are expedited. So we have a place where you can ask questions, you can talk about problems in and around your home, in your neighborhood, uh, you can talk about problems in parks, we can talk about restaurant problems like um, um, health concerns, for example, or accessibility, 
Uh, and then we have, of course, your standard streets and utilities. So if it's okay, I'm just going to run through one example here with streets. What happens is you select that and go to the map. Go to bring up. There we go. So if you have an iPhone or an Android phone with GPS, it will take you to where you are. But that may or may not be. You may have driven home after you saw a problem. And so you can enter an address up here at the top or you can still click on the map and say, hey, I have a pothole right here, and it will pick the address for you and post it. So now we know where it is. And believe it or not, this is one of our prompts when we get calls. Well, where was that? Well, somewhere north of Burger King. And so for us, sometimes it's a hunt and peck issue, especially with a lot of new students in town who don't necessarily know uh, all the street names. So this has been uh, helpful. So the citizen can click Done. And, and you can see it leaves them. The red X is next. Tell us more details. And each of these menus are customized. So this one's particularly customized for streets. Remember, we selected streets. So we have a set of menus. And we took these from uh, feedback we got. So when we got calls, we tried to remember all the things we always get asked pertaining to streets. Um, the good news is we work this back in. We create this. So as we get new things or We'll, we'll add to the list or, or take from the list. So it's something that we can create and morph and change. But in this case, let's just do the good old famous pothole. And then you can come down here and type a description that says, I got a pothole that's big enough for a Volkswagen to fit in. What are y'all thinking? And then you can tell me done. It did it to me. Oh. Can you click it on your end? type something in there. I've been maybe waiting for that. I probably got it. There we go. Just wait for me to type something. So we give it some details. You see the next item up is you can add a photo. So if you're on the web based, you can take a photo off your hard drive. If you're on your phone, it goes to a little different look and it says, do you want to get it out of your photo library or do you want to use your camera? So you can take a picture of the pothole uh, with a sad face and send it to us or, or not. And then last is an option to keep this confidential. So you do register the app when you get it so we know who you are so we can correspond with you. But if you want to keep this confidential, it doesn't go where other people in the public can see what you reported. In other words, if you had an issue with your neighbor and you wanted to report something to your neighbor, you may not want that to be public, and we understand that. So this is the option that you would check for that. And so if we hit submit, and I'm not going to do that because somebody will be looking for potholes shortly if I do that. Uh, then it goes and we instantly get an email. I would get an email that says, hey, your request has been received. So, uh, and then we would process. So let me break back to the thing. I'm sorry, are there any questions before I get out of this or menus? Um, or I can show them to you. You want to wait or do you oh, do you have It doesn't matter to me whichever way you want to do it. Okay. Well, let's go ahead. Okay. Yeah. See what else there we is. can bring it back up if we need to. Oh, yes, that would be great. Okay. Okay, so what happens after you send the request in is it gets directed to the right department and then can then be assigned to even work crews and a work order is created as quick as you hit that send button. So this is an example of what our staff console looks like. So this is what we get to see. And this is just an example of requests that have come in and their status. They've been received. They may have been completed. We can sort these by any imaginable way that you want, uh, from location to type or maintenance or whatever. So it gives us managing all this a way to look daily or hourly or what we want to do and find this. So if we go in and pick a request, basically we get a, a sheet that looks like this that comes up. And it shows us, you know, what the problem was. And by the way, this is a real one. What the problem was was a dead dog in front of the Coliseum on the University Drive side. It tells us who it was assigned to, which is assigned to Jose Oliveira, who's in sanitation. And then what was the resolution? And the bottom area that you see uh, down here is a list of several emails that went out that said, hey, we got it. We're processing it. We have found it, fixed it, and closed it. And by the way, he makes a note that it was not a, a dead dog, it was a beaver. And that's, a tr that's true, true story. So uh, if now, if we wanted to find out annually how many beaver strikes we had on roads, well, we could be able to run a summary and get that, and I suspect it's not a large number. But uh, interestingly, all this data is then available for us to, to use and harvest, and, and, and so it's great. 
But this is kind of what we're watching, and those emails that go out go to whoever the requestor was, in this case, the, the citizen. So we think this feedback is great. We think it's a great opportunity to be able to engage people, uh, and, and we hope in a, in a way that feels friendly and responsive. Transparency and response is really the, the premise for this whole thing. So. So, Mayor, that's the end of, of my presentation. So, after right. any public comment, I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, let's see. If um, Garth, do you have anything you would like to ask? No, I'm eager to download it. That's awesome. No, no, no questions. <laughs> okay, uh, Jay. Um, no questions, really. I'm, uh, you know, I'd, possibly the layperson, the the uh, recurring fee each year might seem a little high, but given the efficiencies that this is going to uh, um, facilitate, I, that seems like quite a bargain to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very excited to have it in the works. Okay. Amelia? Yeah, I just, I wanted to ask a question about how it works once, I mean, I saw the, the, the page that you showed where it shows, I don't know if it was like the list of work orders or what, but in terms of accountability, is there somebody who is checking to see that each is completed or, or how, how is that happening to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks the way that, um, it, w it was much easier for our earlier system for things to, to, to fall through the cracks. Sure. No, and that's a great question. So there's two things that are going on. These requests come in to a designated person, Amelia. And in this case, then they're assigned, like you saw to Jose Oliveira a while ago, or assigned. Well, um, in this case, that's in sanitation. So Kerry Walker was also notified. And Kerry Walker begins to track this request and sees that it was executed and closed. Now, what happens if we put it off and put it off is this is set up to at an interval of a few days to begin to retransmit and it will email Carrie and it will email Kim in this case. Uh, there's no resolution to this. There's no resolution to this. So uh, it actually pesters us into being really good at this. So uh, yeah, so I think it's built into the system as well as the fact now management can monitor this very, very easily wherever they are. So we're hoping between those two things that we don't have things fall in the cracks and you're absolutely right. I, I laugh how many times at night I send myself an email because somebody told me in the Kroger parking lot that there was a pothole somewhere and I almost forgot to do it. So you're absolutely right. So we're, we're excited from that standpoint. I, I will tell you and, and then shut up, but some of our staff were a little stressed over having all this documented when we used to just drive by and fix things. So uh, they've been kind of getting acclimated to this, but I think they've all found out they're getting things done faster. The average response time for the 600 work orders we've done has been a little over four days from beginning to resolution. So we feel really good about that. Did that answer, I'm sorry, all your question, Amelia? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, to follow up on uh, Amelia's question, when a citizen uh, calls in, does he get like a reference number and maybe in three or four days it hadn't been, his issue hadn't been taken care of? Does he have a reference number to come back and pull that up? And it's even better than that. So because we know that it's this citizen in particular that made the request, he at any time can pull up all of his or her requests. So he doesn't have to look for a reference number. We know who they are, and they can go in any time and see what the status of them are and, and then contact us again if they want. So, uh, so they're literally customized to that person. They don't have to seek it. It's right there on their phone. So that, that means he, at one time or another, he gave up his, like, email Yes, yeah, so when you download the app or, or the desktop version, it's, you it's have to register, and there's some uh, email information to do that, and okay. it's the only way the system works. Um, so. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. I, I like the program. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, this is yeah. great. I hope you all are ready, because we have a lot of people that like to go around and find <laughs> things that are a little... Well, Mr. Riggs, Tread has been marvelous, Mayor, in setting this up, as you can yes. imagine. We've been working for months. Yeah. This looks simple, but it's been, it's taken some months, and Tread walked into my office, and he said, you know if you do this tonight, we're, we're going to have a request in the morning. Yeah. Are you ready? I said, yeah, yeah we're, we're ready. So. Good. Well, that's great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, our next topic, we will um, look at strategies to assist in cities planning and economic development efforts and hear from Elena Chafin. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Council. Uh, Elena Chafin, City Planner. 
Um, we are very excited to be bringing this discussion uh, to this evening. Um, before we get started, I do just want to mention that we are going to be covering a lot of information, and so please don't hesitate to stop and interrupt and ask questions or uh, points of clarification along the way. Um, a lot of these plans and studies are things that a lot of other cities do, but they will be new for Nacogdoches. And so um, we expect you, as well as people watching at home, to have lots of questions and um, want to talk about it more. And we're excited about that. So we are going to start out by talking about some recent changes in leadership uh, that Nacogdoches has experienced this year and the kinds of opportunities that that presents itself with. Um, we're also going to touch on some of the city's current long-range planning and studies that we have either adopted or are currently undertaking. And then we'll discuss a list of potential studies and plans that uh, city staff has identified working with other departments um, that would further a number of the city's long-term goals and objectives. Um, I did want to take a moment and let you know that we did make some minor changes to the PowerPoint slides from what was in your packet. Uh, those include um, that matrix that included the estimated cost and the timeline for the various projects. We broke those into two slides. So the first one is going to show you the funded projects that are currently underway, and then the second one will just have the unfunded ones. So it's a little bit easier to, to digest and, and view, especially for the people watching at home. Um, we also incorporated the cost of one of the studies into the total city investment total. Um, this was the risk and resilience assessment and emergency response plan. And we didn't include it initially because it's required by regulation. Um, so it's one of those things that's not funded, but it needs to be funded. Um, but we did go ahead and incorporate it in that total number. And then we also included um, estimations for timelines and completion for the various types of studies. So as we go through the descriptions, you'll see a little uh, parentheses beside the title, and it will give you like a month range, six to eight months or 12 to 18 months to give you an idea of how long those studies actually take to complete. So those are just some of the differences between uh, the PowerPoint slides that were in your packet and then the ones that we'll be reviewing this evening. So with that, we'll get started. So this year, Nacogdoches uh, has gone through a number of changes in new community leadership, including a brand new superintendent for the Nacogdoches ISD, who was hired on in March of this year. Uh, we also have a new university president at SFA and a new city manager, both of which uh, came on board in August of this year. So these changes in leadership, coupled with uh, the growth that's anticipated with the um, future I-69 improvements, create a opportunity to reevaluate, identify, and then plan for a current and future needs um, of the community with a fresh set of eyes. And City Council in the past, in the recent past, has also had a lot of discussion regarding uh, long-term planning efforts, um, including the age of the current comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2003. Um, and I've had a couple of discussions about updating the land use plan and transportation plan and some of those other uh, chapters in that document. There's also been a lot of interest and discussion of council in neighborhood revitalization and infill development and creating long-term uh, policy initiatives and strategies to address some of those goals and objectives. And with this in mind, staff was directed to uh, conduct an inventory of existing plans that may be in need of an update or revision, and then identify additional plans and studies needed to further current future uh, planning, engineering, and economic development efforts. Uh, this was a, a collaborative effort working with the city manager's office, engineering, and NEDCO, uh, specifically, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Larissa Philpont, who was instrumental in, in gathering and compiling a lot of that information from the various departments. And it was really good to work with NEDCO, especially Larissa being the previous city planner, so we could work together and kind of brainstorm and identify those um, efforts that would have a mutual benefit for the city and identify some of those longstanding um, issues that the city is still currently facing. So um, that was really important for this process. And it's still an ongoing process. Uh, since we put this together, we've actually identified a couple of additional plans uh, that, we'll, that we may be adding in the future um, just for discussion purposes. Um, but this is a very dynamic issue and it is ongoing and uh, we continue to work with other city departments to identify needs and resources that could um, help them further their goals and objectives. So the, all of these planning efforts um, are key to bridging the gap between where Nacogdoches is today and where we want to be in the future. And the intent is to create a holistic, comprehensive, uh, strategic action plan essentially to help the city manage our growth and resources. So that's the uh, primary goal behind uh, the various proposed plans and studies. So on your screen, you'll see a combined list of both plans and studies that the city is currently, uh, currently undertaking. And this is identified by a check mark in the first column on the left. 
policy, as well as additional proposed plans identified by staff. So where you see a blank, uh, those are plans or studies that either um, have not been funded and or approved. In your packet, we did include a little short description for each of these items, and we'll go over those in more detail as we move through the presentation, but generally, um, all of these plans are intended, are intended to help inform policy development and funding uh, for public programs such as CIP programs, um, economic development efforts, and other community uh, planning programs. Um, all of these studies except one include outside consulting services, and uh, the one that doesn't include outside consulting services is the incentive policy, which is an in-house update that's being conducted by NEDCO. Um, and these consultants play a key role in supplementing city personnel since they usually offer a higher level of professional experience and expertise um, than may exist on staff. And they also help take out some of that perceived bias that you might have from doing it in-house. And so uh, current city staff, including department heads, usually wear a lot of hats um, and simply may not have the capacity uh, to take on some of these additional efforts. So that's why um, outside consulting services are so essential to some of these programs. Thank you. So as I said, uh, this is one of the slides that's a little bit different from what you had in your packet. Um, for each particular plan or study, the title is bolded, and then out beside it in parentheses, you have a, a month range for the estimated time that those plans are typically completed. A comprehensive plan, so I know that you're very familiar with. This is the official policy document guiding long-range planning and community development within the city. Uh, it's usually updated every 10 years. Uh, the last update that the city did for our comprehensive plan was in 2003, so we're, we are a little bit behind schedule. Uh, this plan provides a vision for the future of the city by reviewing current conditions and identifying long-range goals and objectives and then creating um, impl implementation strategies to achieve those goals and objectives. Um, they usually include a future land use plan, a transportation and thoroughfare plan, and a parks and community facilities plan. Uh, for Nacogdoches in particular, uh, this plan is also proposed to include an element that would uh, provide a more in-depth study for the proposed I-69 corridor, which would include more specific future land use, utility, and design suggestions. The downtown master plan creates a vision for downtown Nacogdoches, including building facades, streetscapes, pedestrian access, parking, and other public amenities. Uh, this plan would act as a framework for future ordinances and initiatives, um, including coordinated strategies to help reinvigorate the downtown area and make it an attractive place to live, work, and play. Uh, this plan usually also includes a market analysis to um, identify new retail entertainment and housing, and then identify um, any kind of gaps or new retail and housing that might be needed in the future years. Uh, there was a comprehensive design plan for the downtown area, but it was last completed in 1998, so it is in need of an update. The drainage CIP plan is just like it sounds. Uh, it identifies areas in need of drainage improvements and proposes capital drainage projects to address uh, drainage issues throughout the city. And uh, we currently don't have um, a plan like this adopted for NAC Dutchess. The Hazard Mitigation Action Plan um, identifies potential hazards to the city. Uh, these usually include natural disasters such as drought, flood, tornado, wildfire, uh, and severe weather. And the purpose is to propose action that the city can take to reduce or counter the impacts of future occurrences of these types of disasters. Uh, this plan is required for several emergency management grants from the state of Texas and the federal government. Um, and the Hazard Mitigation Action Plan was last updated in 2014. But again, it's one of those plans that has to be updated regularly just to uh, maintain our qualification for state and federal funding. Uh, fiscal study and strategy. Uh, this reviews the city of Nacogdoches funds and proposes strategies to reduce intergovernmental transfers and identify funding for capital and economic development opportunities. And again, uh, this is one of the studies that we currently don't have on the books. And essentially, it's trying to be more fiscally and resource um, aware and just trying to make sure that we are uh, utilizing our resources effectively. Uh, the housing needs study uh, reviews current housing stock for both single family and multifamily and projects housing needs for near and long-term growth. Uh, this information can be used to identify housing issues and solutions that, then, that can then be turned into uh, strategic decisions related to um, improvements to the local housing market. These types of assessments are um, common used as a basis for securing uh, financing for various housing programs and projects, um, and they can also help create policies and initiatives to fill housing gaps um, through incentives and catalyst projects. There was an affordable housing needs 
um, study that was done in 2008, um, but then there was no comprehensive housing study followed up after that. The Unified Development Code is essentially combining the various city uh, development standards. It includes the zoning ordinance, signed ordinance, and subdivision ordinance, and it combines these into one document to uh, reduce conflicting language and then modernize those development standards. Um, our subdivision ordinance was adopted in 1970, but has only received minor revisions since then. Uh, the zoning ordinance was uh, updated in 1998, but again, we've just done kind of minor revisions along the way as necessary. And then the current signed ordinance was adopted in 2005, uh, with again, just minor revisions um, since then. The multimodal transportation plan is a plan intended to expand travel choices for re residents, businesses, and visitors uh, by facilitating multiple modes of transportation. So this includes driving, biking, walking, and transit. Uh, this is done by identifying and prioritizing transportation corridors for non-vehicular access, and then usually proposes projects and improvements and design standards to help um, facilitate those goals. Uh, these plans may also identify strategies to help ensure that the city's transportation investments are also complementing our land use and economic development strategies. Small area plans are kind of like a comprehensive plan, but on a much smaller scale. They provide detailed long-range plans for specific uh, neighbor, neighborhood-sized areas. They typically provide residential, uh, they typically include residential neighborhoods, but they can also include commercial and mixed-use areas that may be experiencing rapid change or areas that the city has identified for targeted economic investment and they want to create a um, vision and strategic plan to market the area further. Uh, these plans also include uh, projected projects to um, create a catalyst for, for development so they can improve or they can include CIP projects and additional market analysis. Uh, the retail study utilizes cell phone data uh, that will identify a true market area of the city and identify retail le uh, leakages to inform future retail recruitment efforts. Um, the most recent retail leak leakage and market area study was performed in, tw in 2013. Um, our economic development department recommends completing this particular study after we really see the true impacts of the uh, COVID-19 on our, our retail market. And then there's just various economic development opp opportunities. This is really a catch-all uh, to cover types of studies that include, uh, or, or that could include design workshops for vacant downtown buildings, um, or additional economic impact studies for potential business expansion and locations. All right, so this is the plans and policies matrix that has the expanded uh, cost estimates and the timelines. We did break it down into two slides. So this first one includes the plans and studies that are funded and underway with working timelines. And these include the fire station study, the uh, return on investment study, and the water and sewer master plan. Uh, the city's total investment for these studies uh, to date is $218,000 and with $50,000 funded in the 2019-2020 fiscal year. The next slide includes the plans and studies that have not been funded or approved. Um, these are the plans that we uh, created or listed working with other city, city departments. Uh, we put together a preliminary timeline with estimates for discussion purposes, but these are just estimates. None of these have been um, vetted or uh, received RFQs or RFPs for, so they are just estimates, so they could be subject to change. Um, now, just by the nature of these plans, some of these plans would need to be, be completed prior to others. So, for instance, uh, the comprehensive plan is kind of the foundation uh, that lays the groundwork for a future housing needs study, um, sorry, a future housing needs study, um, or an update in unified development code um, and things of that nature. So. When you see the list of the plans, it's not necessarily a list of priority, more of a sequence of how these plans might play out over time. Um, and based on the preliminary timeline and cost estimates, the total funding to complete all of the proposed plans over the next three years would be right at uh, $790,000, with 540 of that, could po which could be possibly funded uh, this fiscal year with our current balance. And you'll hear a report la later this evening from finance to talk about uh, where where we are as far as um, that update, and I'm sure she'll go into more detail um, on that. And again, these are just preliminary time timelines for our discussion purposes. So to summarize, these plans and studies uh, have been on some of the staff's wish list for quite some time, uh, and this presentation is the first step in beginning the conversation with council about bringing some of these forward. Uh, we do understand that this is 
a lot of information and I went through it quickly because I know you guys have a long agenda. Um, and we know that you'll have plenty of questions, which we are excited to hear. But tonight we won't be asking for any action or necessarily any specific uh, direction. We just wanted to open it up for questions from council and then hopefully bring this back ne uh, next month to have um, some additional dialogue and perhaps some direction at that time. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and open up for any questions. Jay? Um, I have a wealth of questions, okay. which I will not worry about <laughs> with tonight. I'll, I'll do that separately from the meeting. Um, I, I love the concept of updating all of these plans um, and updating the, the overall uh, master plan sort of as a result. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's something that, that in my mind is, is long overdue, um, almost 20 years since the previous one um, is uh, an awfully long time and things have changed a lot during that time. So I, I'm very much in favor of, of, uh, of doing all of, all of these plan updates, um, but no, no particular right. questions right now. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Amelia? Um, on the, it just, it wasn't clear to me on the comprehensive plan, is that redoing the entire one or sort of focusing it on on particular chapters the way that we had done um, in a work session last year? Um, this would be, well, it could be a number of things. It could be more of a um, comprehensive plan uh, appraisal and evaluation report where we tackle certain sections or chapters um, and focus on those. Um, the, the more components of the plan that you update, of course, the more expensive that it gets. And so typically what you see in these types of updates are um, the transportation section, the land use section, and utility section. And then these are um, updated and informed with current um, demographic information, a lot of community outreach and engagement, which is why you see that 12 to 16 month timeline because it's very community engagement heavy. Um, but this can include the entire comprehensive plan. This can include just various sections or chapters. The cost estimate that we provided in the timeline really is just those key components, your, your transportation plan, um, your future land use plan, and then um, perhaps even your utility or housing section, but I know there's other plans and studies that we, we propose that could incorporate utilities and drainage and things of that sort. So uh, to answer your question, um, the proposal that we've um, presented tonight would just be sections. It wouldn't be the whole uh, entire overhaul. It would just be more of a appraisal report and then update. Okay, yeah, um, because I mean, I know that it is almost 20 years old, but I, I don't think that we should go ahead and assume that we need to redo the entire, entire thing given, um, I mean, a, a consideration of course is cost, but also there might be some things that are just fine the way, the way that they are. So thank you. Um, that's the only question I had. Um, I mean, I'm sure that there will be a lot more specific questions as we get a little deeper into each one of these things, but I love um, the initiative. I like the um, overall subject matters that were that were picked out um, and I'm excited to, to get more into it. Thank you. Um, just as a follow-up, I know that the reason we had initially started talking about only redoing sections at a time was because a big part of a strategic plan is the implementation portion. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the finances or the capabilities of implementing a lot of things that that are decided on and what people want and mm -hmm. uh, then it's useless I mean it really doesn't it, it ends up being more of a guide mm -hmm. than a true plan and so um, I think that's where council was with you know deciding of, of trying to decide which sections to do first and mm -hmm. then you know following through and then when it's time when you get finished it's time to go back mm -hmm. and start um, again with the new ones so um, uh, Mr. Bolden yes um, the study plan uh, for housing uh, you have for 2021 20, and 2022 yes, uh, during our chamber um, meetings on Tuesdays 
I was surprised to hear that housing was one of the number one. Uh, I always thought it was maybe school district kept other businesses from coming to Nacogdoches. Mm -hmm. But in these meetings, it's been stated that housing was the most number one need for business to come to uh, Nacogdoches area, county, et cetera. And we have that study preached out 2021-2022. I think we need to look at that earlier than that time frame. Okay. Um, which, and, and again, this is a very flexible preliminary mm -hmm. timeline. Uh, I think the reason that we placed it, you know, late, later than some of the other plans is because um, the, the comprehensive plan also includes that land use element that really not dictates, but is a guide for where your housing, where your housing should go. And so it's important to do a housing need study, but I think a component of that is knowing where, where we actually want the housing first. Um, and so that's something that could be done, I think, immediately after a comprehensive plan update. But I think um, it, would be, it would be benefited from doing that long range evaluation first. Um, but you know, the housing need study, we could do that I'm next week, or not not next week, but that is certainly something that could be uh, pushed up on the list if it was a priority of council to go ahead and um, pursue that, that. that. That should be all part of our economic plan, mm -hmm. housing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, my understanding it is critical in, in the Nacogdoches area, the need for the housing. Mm -hmm. uh, the comprehensive plan, looking at other cities, their, their list is just as long as it's ours with a lot of the sections haven't had any work done on it whatsoever, but some has, some completed. But most of those cities, they focus on like maybe 10 sections that they worked on and looked on and funded, and it was done quicker instead of having, you know, maybe 30 sections that they was looking at and citizens. Uh, but all of this was citizens and city engagement. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, you know, the city decided this is what we're going to take a look at. It was always citizen and a city engagement in that area. So maybe we focus on maybe out of the out of 30. I, I, that's a contrary number. I don't know why I said 30. <laughs> but if we just focus on maybe 10 mm -hmm. and then fund those and, and complete them, uh, Oh, well, I already asked about uh, When we update the comprehensive plan, I mean, we are going to include the citizens of Nacogdoches. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, one of the reasons that that plan takes so much time is because there is, it is very heavy on the community engagement because you first have to um, identify the goals and objectives and priorities of the community, and you can't do that without that right. public engagement, um, and because it's been so long, our our demographics are a little bit different, our community le le leadership is different, so um, the, um, part, uh, the values and priorities of our community are not what they were in 2003, and so that's really the first thing is establishing that, and then everything stems, stems from that unified vision, goals, objectives, and priorities of the community. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. I don't know if this part of, uh but creating incentives for redevelopment and in encouraging investment in our community from within, and but also make it easy for interested businesses and developments to come to Nacogdoches. But uh, incentive for uh, uh, redevelopment within our own district area and city communities. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to push that issue. Uh, yes, and... Um, that may be an economic development issue. Well, I think infill and redevelopment and neighborhood mm -hmm. revitalization can be a, co a component of several of these plans. Uh, the comprehensive plan does have a housing component, um, right. and then the housing need study can actually be used as a basis for funding for future programs and housing policy, um, and 
can be used to create strategies for specific areas. Um, and so when we talk about the housing needs study and some of these uh, smaller small area plans, those are actually um, geared specifically to evaluate a smaller ge geographic area in detail and come up with strategies for redevelopment, for infill. Um, maybe it may, may require some city intervention um, or cat catalyst projects, but uh, those elements can uh, can um, very easily be incorporated into a lot of the elements of these various plans and studies, or it can be its own standalone. Um, and we could research some additional plans that would specifically target those objectives, if you like. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> We're going to be busy reading studies. I like it. Uh, it does seem like a lot of studies, but I absolutely appreciate how they're interwoven and they're uh, dependent on each other. So just as an example, the fire station study that we've got rolling we need to know what areas of town we're going to be growing toward for that really to be effective. But same thing with the land use and, and so on. Like we're, we've got to be able to uh, cast a milestone or throw a, throw a marker out there to know, are, are we going to be in 25 years, are we going to be a community of 35,000 people or are we going to be a community of 50 or 75 or 80 and where, where could we possibly practically fit that in? So I, I appreciate that it is a ton of, you know, it is an awful lot of money, but, it's, it's pretty critical, I think, that we begin moving these balls forward. And so I, I appreciate the effort on this. And I, I appreciate that it's not super simple and clear. We just do one study a year. But, um, yeah, no, no real questions. Just e eager to indeed get the ball rolling. And um, I, I'll be curious to uh, kind of get into the comprehensive plan because I see where that does indeed serve as the foundation, but which pieces do we start with? There are going to be some of those that are going to, that are going to touch the drainage and that are going to touch the downtown, that are going to touch the, the hazard mitigation. It's, it's going to be pretty critical that we make sure we move that forward if it needs to be updated. on. And so I think that's, yeah, no, nothing else. That's, that's good. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will move to uh, number six, our open forum. Did we have anyone sign up for that? No, ma'am. Okay. Number seven is our consent agenda. If council wants to remove something for uh, discussion, if not, chair would entertain a motion for approval. Mayor, I wanted to remove item C. I just, I, I have a question about it, the two-year contract with Hillco Partner. Do you just need a, a, a question answered? Do you want to have a little bit of discussion about it? Um, I just have a question that I would like answered. I, don't, I mean, I don't have outside of the question. I don't have a particular problem with it. Um, so if you want, I can just I can go ahead and ask it. Yes, let's go ahead and do that. Let's get our city manager up here, and uh, you go right ahead and ask your question. Okay. Is he up there? I can't see. The plans thing is still on my screen, so I can't see oh, yes. Mario. He is here. Okay. Hey, Mario. Um, my question is, given the um, proposed bills in the Texas legislature putting a ban on cities lobbying, um, how, how would that affect this contract? Are we still going to be on the hook for... $120,000 if it turns out that they can't do any lobbying work for us? Right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, well, so far right now, the, the, the bills are, are just uh, pre-session bills that, that have been filed, so the session has not actually convened, so, um, so we're not quite sure what the outcome of those bills will be, if, if any. Uh, but typically what you have in, in any contract, you have a non-appropriation clause, in your contract so if if those issues do become law and they cannot perform legally because it's 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 outlawed then we would just the council would just invoke its non-appropriation clause and we should be able to to uh terminate with cause or terminate i guess probably for a cause or even convenience more than likely i see the city attorney squirming so i probably <laughs> completely uh, derailed us here Not at all. Matter of fact, you're wrong, Mark. I just couldn't stand it. I wanted to come talk. But uh, um, essentially, if 
um, if one of those bills uh, prevails um, and this was deemed not to be a legal practice, um, then it would indeed be void due to illegality and therefore we would have no obligation to go forward with it or continue uh, with that contract. Thank you. That answers my question. I don't have any more problems with it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So then uh, does someone want to make a motion for the, uh, the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda as it is written. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. If no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. And our regular agenda, item A, is a public hearing. Consider a request for approval of a development plan for a senior center. Um, let's see, and that is Elena Chapin again. Hello. All right, thank you. All right, um, do you want to see it? Should be um, able to use the amendment. Yeah, we can. Is that All right, well, while we're waiting for the presentation, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so, as a reminder, uh, well, uh, to restate, this is a request for approval of a development plan for a senior center in an established plan development district, um, which is the Austin Hill subdivision. Uh, our PD development, our PD plan development process does include a three-step approval process. Uh, the first step is the concept plan, which establishes the guidelines for the district. Um, and outlines general land uses and intensities and outlines the uh, boundaries of the district. The second phase is the development plan uh, that contains all the information of the concept plan but includes more detailed information as to the specific location for those land uses, including uh, building, landscaping, and parking. And the purpose of the development plan is to ensure that the project is moving forward um, consistent with the concept plan approved by council. The final step is the actual PD site plan that gets permitted for construction and that is reviewed and approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So just to remind the council, there are three steps. The PD concept plan that establishes the district, uh, the development plan, which is more of a preliminary plan that more clearly defines how those land uses are going to be laid out on the property, and then the final site plan approval that uh, goes before our Planning and Zoning Commission. So this is the second step, the PD development plan. Uh, the original PD concept and development plan for the Austin Hill subdivision was approved in 2004 and uh, with the primary use being a single family subdivision um, and those uses also included a church and a future assisted living and nursing facility um, and hopefully we can get our PowerPoint up so we can see some of those exhibits.
can't do that pretty quick. We could move on to another mm -hmm. agenda item and come back to this. Um, let's do that because I do want to have the uh, concept plan and development plan up on the screen whenever we're talking about the, the different changes that are being made, um, as well as the no, no, uh, notification map and some of the surrounding areas. So um, with that, Mayor, if you'd like to. Okay. Let's go ahead and move to B, and we will try to come back to that okay. as soon as, they'll let me know as soon as they, um, they get that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so let's move to B, a uh, presentation of year-end financial recap for 2019 and 20. Um, good evening, Pam Kerbo. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well, thanks. I'm going to take off my mask so I can put on my glasses. Unfortunately, I can't do them both. <clears throat> How are you all this evening? Doing well. I um, have a little bit of good news for you all this evening. Um, this is a little bit late in the, in the fiscal year to be doing a year-end recap for September. Uh, we don't normally do this, but this year I thought it was important for you all to understand how we ended um, last year prior to the audit being presented, um, only because of the um, impact, um, or maybe in our case, a little bit of lack of the impact of um, the pandemic on the city's uh, finances. So tonight I was just kind of basically going to take a, a broad 30,000 foot view of, of where we ended the year on our major funds as far as revenues and expenditures and kind of the effect of that. Um, starting with, where am I at? Oh, okay. There we go. So, yeah, you can go ahead and flip over. Yeah. So, starting with our um, general fund, we're going to look at our major revenues for the year. Property taxes came in, of course. Um, they, they are set to always come in pretty close to 100%. This year we, we were um, somewhat um, lucky in the fact that the, um, the pandemic actually hit after most property taxes had been paid for the fiscal year. And so there was not an impact on that. Um, had that been a couple of months earlier, we could have seen um, some folks that had to postpone making those payments for a, for a few months. And so that did not affect us this, this past year. Um, sales tax, if you'll notice, we were up um, almost 7% on the year, which is kind of surprising um, in the year of, of, you know, a pandemic and, and, and the city, I mean, the state seeing a lot of sales tax hits across the board. We actually were up um, about $455,000 over budget um, due to a couple of things. Um, our, our budget was pretty conservative. Um, we basically budgeted for, for like a 1% increase over the prior year. But we had a couple of uh, large audit adjustments this year, and so that, that helped to the tune of a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And we only had a couple of months that we actually saw a decrease. We started, the, the pickup happened very soon for us. Um, if you'll recall, I think in the monthly emails that I send y'all um, regarding sales tax, um, we have um, seen several areas, especially in, in retail home improvement during the pandemic, that saw double digit increases. And so um, things were a little bit of anomaly for us, but, but we did end the year picking up um, a good chunk of money in the sales tax area. Um, franchise fees came in pretty much on target for our budget. Um, I think, let's see, we're gonna talk about it in a little bit. They actually um, were, were down as to what um, we, we had seen in the prior year, but um, we'll, we'll explain that in just a little bit more. Uh, court fines, of course, were down significantly. Um, the court um, was shut down for a, for a, for a few weeks, um, and then um, patrol uh, department um, was actually, the traffic division, I'm sorry, um, was, was disa disabled for a while. And so, um, you know, consequently, uh, court fines um, were, were down significantly for this fiscal year. Um, other revenues, of course, <laughs> they were up significantly. That happens to be um, one major part of that is building permits. We were up a couple of hundred thousand dollars in building permits. We had several big um, um, building permits issued this year, not only NISD for all of their bond um, improvements. Uh, Dr. Klein, we had several big, big commercial um, uh, building permits issued this year. Um, and transfers, of course, um, they are budgeted right at uh, one hundred percent. So at the end of the year, we actually ended up picking up about half, half of half of a million dollars in revenues over what we had anticipated in the general fund. Um, part of that, of course, is the first twenty percent allocation 
of the CARES money. So at the end of the day, when you pull that 370000 out, we still were up about $150,000 over what we had budgeted. So in a pandemic year, I think that's pretty awesome for us. Um, if you go ahead and jump to the next one, or I guess I can do this one on there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so taking a look at how we actually ended on each of these items, property taxes, we were up 8% over the year, the prior year. If y'all recall, last year we increased the property tax rate um, by the eight, almost, it was like 7.99%. Um, and so that is, that is exactly what we an anticipated. Um, sales tax ended up being up um, $322,000 over the prior year. Franchise fees were down $107,000 from the prior year. Um, this is what I was, was speaking to earlier. There was a law change this year, and so now if a company has both internet and um, tele telecom franchise fees due, they only pay one now. They, did, they used to have to pay two, and so the law changed, so that did affect us um, over the prior year. We knew that law was coming, so the budget was not as impacted. Uh, we, we ended up making budget, but from comparing to prior year, we were down. Uh, of course, building permit fees were up 375% over the prior year, and like I said, that, those were some of the uh, bigger items that we had going on um, construction in town. Fines, of course, were down 223000 over the prior year, but overall revenues were up $468,000 from the prior year. Um, of course, part of that is the CARES money. Um, on the expenditure side, um, we were within expectations. Um, at 93% general fund wide, which equated to about $1.7 million um, in budgeted expenditures that we did not spend um, for, for a variety of, of things. Um, unfilled positions, we always saved some money there. This year we saved a lot of money there. We had at one point, I believe, um, the police department was down almost 20% of their personnel um, that's extremely um, a high amount. I think uh, I estimated right at $365,000 worth of police salaries that were unexpended for this prior fiscal year. Um, recreation, um, their revenues were down, but their expenditures were as well because when you don't have basketball, you don't have to pay referees. So we, we were down about $80,000 in expenses on the recreation side. Of course, we deferred um, as much as we could during the, the fiscal year, um, we had a hiring freeze, we did a travel and training freeze, um, we postponed anything that was not absolutely necessary. And so at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we ended up not spending about $1.7 million of, of the, um, the expenditures. Now, I will be able to give you a pretty good estimate of what our um, reserves over our requirement are going to be. Um, after we finish our year-end um, carryovers, and those are due to, to Mario by the end of this month. Um, I do anticipate that our um, um, reserves over our standard 25% requirement is going to be close to $4 million, maybe over. That includes the CARES money. Um, so um, in the spring, when we start the budget cycle, we are going to be sitting down and discussing um, what you're what you might want to do with some of those those one-time expenditures um, I know that that some of the studies that that um, Elena just spoke of will have some of these funds could be used to utilize that for some of those studies so as we get closer to the new budget cycle we'll give you all a better uh, understanding of where we are but for right now the general fund on the on the reserve size is looking very very healthy um, on utility and sanitation funds uh, water and sewer sales were down about 2% um, this year over prior year collections, which is about $370,000. And the majority of that is just because it was an extremely wet year. And so um, we, we have to watch the, um, the weather trends with, with water sales, and, and this just happened to be a pretty wet year for us. So we were down over prior year collections. Um, sanitation and landfill, um, up 1%. That's really kind of flat for us, honestly. Um, expenditures again, um, all utility and sanitation funds together were within 90 to 94 percent of budget, um, and there again is just because we had kind of put a a freeze on mid-year spending and and did not fill some of the positions that that were open there for a little while. On 
the hotel tax fund, there's not as much good news here. And I know that during the budget process, we discussed this at length. Um, hotel taxes comp compared to prior year collections were down over $189,000 for last fiscal year. Um, expenditures um, pretty much where, where we anticipated them being. Um, if you'll recall, that was one of the, the impetus for, for council voting to, to um, do a one-year um, subsidy for the CVB because their funding does directly come from this hotel tax fund. Um, and so we're, we're monitoring that. After this first quarter, we'll be able to come back to you and let you know kind of what the hotel tax is doing. Um, we're hopeful that it will start to, to swing up pretty, pretty soon. And that is pretty much the recap in a nutshell. If y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to, to try to answer them. Uh, Mr. Boulder? I was curious, that why didn't sewer sales? I would have expected that to have been more on the plus side than negative, mainly because more people were at home during this pandemic. True, and but it rained a lot, and so the majority of our big, big water towards the end of the fiscal year is in irrigation. That's that's where, and then industry is another another big user. And so, um, if any of the businesses are, are shut down, and they were a lot of, of our restaurants were at you know either closed for a while mm -hmm. or at, at smaller capacity, and so that does affect it as well. Um, residential usage, honestly, was not, uh, you know, as significantly as impacted as we thought. Um, I'm, I'm like you. You would think people, maybe they just were laying on the couch. I don't know. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, Garth? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the CARES Act. Which which figure was that? Like, it, uh, you mentioned both on the balance sheet, but also revenue. I, I, right. There's been a bunch of numbers that we've had come in and no, the, some of the data grants. Sure. Do you know off the head? I do. Um, that is the, the what we actually have received so far is our first 20% initial allocation, which was 370,000. Um, we have not received the the big portion yet. We submitted all that paperwork actually yesterday, and so that reimbursement should be coming hopefully within the next few months. Um, that was the additional 1.4, I think, million. Um, but yeah, for these for these numbers. Just the three hundred and seventy thousand dollars is is all that's included because that's all we've actually uh, had on hand. Awesome. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Jay. No particular questions for me. Thank you for the mm -hmm. recap. Of that that's very helpful. Amelia. Amelia had to step away. She had to leave the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Appreciate it. Okay, let's return to our public hearing. We're ready to go. And um, this is the development plan for a senior center. All right. Thank you, Mayor Council. All right, so um, yes, let, let's, this is the slide um, earlier where I was talking about the approval process for plan development. Let's go to the next one. All right, thank you. So um, that's fine, thank you. So the, as I stated earlier, the original concept plan and development plan for the subdivision was approved in 2004. Um, and the area that's subject to tonight's request, you can see it on the left-hand side, um, it includes lot one and lot two, was approved for a church and a future assisted living slash uh, nursing facility. And so what you're reviewing tonight is an amendment to that development plan uh, to allow for um, the conversion of the church to a future senior center and then lot two serving as an expansion uh, for that facility. So let's go to the next one. All right, uh, this concept plan was approved uh, in January earlier this year, and as I stated, um, it allows for the conversion of the existing church on Lot 1 fronting West Austin Street uh, to be converted into the Senior Center, and then Lot 2 behind it, uh, which is currently vacant, is going to accommodate a future addition and outdoor activity area. Uh, this plan included a 50-foot 
building setback and landscape buffer along the eastern boundary of the property that abuts those residential lots uh, to mitigate any kind of negative impacts um, that the expansion may have on the existing neighborhood. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the development plan includes all of the information on the concept plan, but it is more detailed and includes more information um, as to the specific location and boundaries of the land uses and the specific uh, proposed improvements regarding parking and landscaping and building location. Uh, this plan illustrates the location of the renovation of the kitchen area that will help um, facilitate the meal service and preparation as provided by the Senior Center. It also illustrates two building additions for phase two, uh, which will be multi-purpose buildings to accommodate um, future activities associated with the Senior Center. It could be classrooms, um, it could be gathering areas, but those buildings will serve the Senior Center. And then the majority of the lot is planned to be preserved for outdoor recreation area um, and to preserve a lot of the landscaping to, to create a scenic um, outdoor gathering space. All right, next slide, please. Uh, oh, I think we skipped a couple. Oh, you know what? It's because um, the PowerPoint slides didn't include all of the exhibits because they were duplicated here, but that's fine. So uh, scroll down to the zoning map, please. It's a little out of order. All right, it looks like I'm missing some exhibits, but that's okay. We will, we will wing it. So um, as I stated, this uh, is an established plan development district. Uh, the surrounding property to the south and to the west is zoned agriculture. Agriculture is kind of our default zoning for whenever property is, is annexed into the city. Um, it can also be designated for areas that are already being used for agricultural purposes or for areas that have, um, that are restricted by um, the lack of access to public infrastructure like water, or sewer, and so forth, or, or so on. Uh, this um, property was annexed back in the 80s. So uh, since then, public infrastructure has been facilitated to that area. So more than likely, um, those surrounding areas will be developed uh, probably as single family. Uh, the property immediately to the north, a west, um, across West Austin Street is also zoned plan development district and is developed as a, a duplex subdivision. Uh, the proposed uh, land use is very compatible with the existing residential development in the area and uh, staff um, anticipates that it will serve as an amenity to the neighborhood for Austin Hills and to the um, neighborhood north of West Austin Street. Um, the future land use designates this area as single family residential, uh, which is described as your conventional one family detached dwellings. And the comprehensive plan also notes that schools, parks, and community facilities such as a senior center uh, are actually recommended to be located in close proximity or within residential neighborhoods. And so staff finds that the request is compliant with the comprehensive plan. And then the photos that you saw, can we get, can we get back to those, Justin? There you go. One more up. Thank you. Um, these are some uh, site photos uh, that were taken uh, last week. The ones on the um, upper left hand and right hand corner are taken from the street view at West Austin Street and Opal Drive. There was a little bit of an elevation difference, um, and so the property does sit a little, a little bit higher than the street level, uh, but you can see the existing facility um, on with photos that are on the bottom. Uh, that is a view looking from Opal Street uh, with the primary entrance and then the, the covered area, uh, which will serve as the future just uh, general public ac access area for uh, the customers of the senior center. And then the next slide is some photos of the rear of the property. Uh, so there aren't any changes being proposed to uh, the current configuration or n number of, of parking spaces. So in, generally, um, in general, uh, this area will remain the same. Um, you see images of the vacant lot to the back that is planned for a future phase um, and, and is 
Senior Center um, is anticipating to preserve a lot of that natural landscape um, for their outdoor recreation facility. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the conditions for approval for a plan development, concept and development plan are outlined on your screen. Uh, staff finds that the request does meet the review criteria for a uh, PD development plan and uh, the, the development plan is consistent with the concept plan that council approved earlier this year. And so based on these findings, staff does make, recommend approval of the request. Um, next slide, please. A staff sent out 15 notices to property owners within the 200 foot notification area. And these consisted of nine owner occupied single family residences, seven residential vacant lots, two single family lots that are currently under construction and two duplex lots across West Austin Street. Uh, we didn't receive any contacts regarding the request. However, uh, a resident of the Austin Hill subdivision representing the neighborhood uh, did attend the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council meeting whenever the concept plan was approved in January. And uh, when we sent out the notices, we were, we were very clear that this is the next stage in development for the Senior Center, uh, which is why we may have not received any, any contacts regarding the request. So with that, that, that concludes staff's presentation. Um, this item was heard by the Planning and Zoning Commission last night at the regular meeting, and they did recommend approval unanimously. And we do have the um, applicant and the property owner in attendance uh, if the council has any questions of them. But thank you. Thank you. So this is a public hearing, so I will now open the public hearing and ask if there's anyone here that would like to speak um, against uh, approval of this development plan. Is there anyone here that wants to speak for? Yes, Army Curtis, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, good evening. Council. Army Curtis with Curtis Architecture uh, here representing the, the Mount Kedosha Senior Center in this project. Um, it's been a, kind of a long road <laughs> until the concept plan, but uh, we are feeling like we have got all the things figured out how the kitchen, for example, is going to sit on the land and on the site, how it interacts with the existing facilities of the site, and also looking ahead at the phase two in the back of how um, their future facilities would work into it. So uh, we're here for to answer, answer any questions you might have, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak for the development? Mike Kelly behind that mask. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've got something on your chin. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, Mike Kelly, I'm the, the chairman of the Nacogdoches Committee on Aging, which operates as the Nacogdoches Senior Center. And I'll keep it very brief. I've been to a lot of city council meetings over the years, but I don't think I've ever been at one that had so much information to be absorbed. Uh, and my... Uh, uh, compliments on on council and staff uh, there's a, a, a lot going on here in fact a lot of the city planners uh, uh, presentation brought up a lot of things uh, related to the senior center we do have a lot of new leadership in the in the town with the university our senior a lot of cities the uh, senior center is a function of of the city um, typically of the Parks and Recreation Department. Nacogdoches Senior Center was started 40 years ago uh, by, by the county of Nacogdoches with a, a lot of effort by Herman Chancellor who had been the county auditor for years. I'm not sure how he leveraged the money because the county budget was very, very poor back then, but in, in 1979, 1980, uh, he formed the Nacogdoches uh, Committee on Aging in the Senior Center that we've been in for 40 years on Harris Street, and that is owned by the County of Nacogdoches still. They've uh, given us use of the building free of charge for 40 years. So this is a big step for us, stepping out and, and doing this, but we get more and more demand as what they, they call the baby boomers are becoming senior citizens. It's more demand, and it's a different demand than what we've had in the past. Uh, more activities, more things to do. It used to be Meals on Wheels, Catfish, and Dominoes. 
and that was about all there was to running the senior center. We've got uh, a lot of lot of activities now, and and a lot more we'd like to do that we just don't have space to do. Um, you know, this is this is a two million dollar capital improvement that the city doesn't have to pay for. But we ask that you 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 approve this, but keep us in mind as you as you look at your comprehensive plan, as you look at your you know legislative issues. Uh, we're providing the senior services, but we need to partner with the city and the county. SFA is a tremendous resource for us for interns. Our medical medical community uh, supports us, helps us out a lot. Um, this, this is our chance to really have a first-class senior center and offer a lot more programs, and, and we're ready to go. 2020 has been hard on the senior population. Uh, been hard on everybody, but them in particular. We haven't been able to. We still do our meals and wheel, on wheels, and that hasn't uh, taken a break. But a lot of our congregate meals, a lot of our group activities, which are so important for the social interaction, uh, what, what we do is a reason for a lot for a lot of people to get up in the morning. It may be bingo, it may be dominoes, maybe line dancing, tai chi. Uh, we we want to get back to that, and we're we're planning on 2021 being the, the year we do. So, any any questions? Uh, be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Elena, you want to come back up? And um, we will start with uh, Garth. Did you have any uh, questions? No, ma'am, no questions. Thank you. Okay, of course. Jay? Um, my, my only question had been addressed, and that was just a, a concern with the, the setback issue on Lot 2, but that's already been addressed. Okay. So. Um, I'm I'm very I'm sad to see the senior center leave my neighborhood ultimately, <laughs> but uh, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with it. Roy, I'm a senior citizen. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's great. Um, so if um, did I close the public hearing? Public hearings closed. <laughs> <laughs> Because there was, I did not ask if there was anyone else that wanted to speak for it, though. I apologize. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Chair will uh, entertain a motion, a motion for approval of the development plan. Okay. What is that, agenda item 9B? Uh, 9A. 9A. I make a motion to approve uh, agenda item 9A as it is written. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Moved and seconded that we approve agenda item 9A as it is written. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Appreciate all you do. And now we will move to agenda item C, consider adoption of the proposed compensation plan and budget amendments for the 19 pay periods in the current fiscal year impacted by the salary adjustments. Pam Kerbo. Thank you, Elena. Appreciate it. Mayor, Council, um, if you'll recall at the last Council meeting, um, we discussed and presented the um, compensation plan that um, both the city staff and the um, consultant had prepared um, as a as just a brief little overview this is this is going to allow the city to actually have a true pay scale system that we have not had in the past um, it will open up and allow for for employees that have tenure to be able to continue to work through their their career path here at the city and um, currently as you'll recall I think at year 10 um, you, you max out on what you can you can make in your your chosen field um, this is going to open that up for for our employees so that going forward um, we will be transitioning to a merit-based system and so that each year during the evaluation process um, they will be eligible um, if if they have performed um, to receive a merit pay increase that will take them above and beyond 
where they were limited in the past to just a tenured, tenure um, salary. Um, as, as a reminder, we built into the budget some funding for this um, in anticipation of, of getting some final numbers. In the general fund, we had budgeted $400,000. We um, actually have, after we gone through, and I think we discussed um, some options that we added after um, the budget um, presentation last year, we, we implemented um, the um, minimum wage of 1270. That was not something that we had included um, when we were discussing uh, the original numbers, um, we actually went in and, and pulled um, uh, firefighters and police officers and um, are going to propose that we pay them um, above the market minimum. Um, so those were some things that were not included when we, when we um, did our estimates for the budget. Um, in order for this to, um, to be implemented, we're, we're going to do this, hopefully, um, January 1. And so for a 19 pay periods is what will be left in the fiscal year. Um, the general fund will um, require $537,390. Um, one thing that we have discussed um, at, at that length with, with the police chief and, and myself and, and Stephen and HR and Mario and city manager's office um, is the need for us to, to hold open um, three of our patrol officer positions um, for the remainder of this fiscal year in order to, to fund this so that we do not have to increase appropriations for this, this fiscal year. Um, as you'll recall, we have had a, a number of open positions there. Um, they're filling them as they can. Um, the police chief um, has, has assured us that this will not be an issue for the re remainder of the fiscal year. Um, same thing in the utility fund. Um, we had budgeted $100,000. Um, we actually had done some, some shifting of, of employees there, and so we were way over in our um, estimates of what that was going to be. A lot of those positions came in closer to market than, than we had anticipated, and so the proposed salary adjustments um, is $45,050 there, so there will be no need in increasing the appropriation there as well. Same thing with sanitation fund. Um, we had budgeted 25000 the proposed salary adjustments are 21950 so there will be no need in an uh, increase there. You, um, oh, I'm sorry, that says utility fund. That should say airport FBO fund um, for the 5000 Budgeted in 2021, we had budgeted 5000 at the airport, um, and those proposed salary adjustments came in at 5800 So here will be the only area in the budget that we will request an increase in appropriation, and that will be for the $800, and that again is for the airport FBO fund. Um, the, the budget amendment um, will still be very detailed because we, we included each of those lump sums in a one-line item, um, and now we will need to, to item transfer those to each of the individual departments, um, and so the, that is the need for the budget amendment tonight. Just as a reminder, the annual plan cost for this pay plan implementation for the 2021, um, for the 21 for the full year, if we were implementing for the full year of 2021, are as follows. Um, general fund was 732,925. Utility fund, 53,950. Sanitation, 29,2. And the airport was 7825. Um, so an annual cost for this, for this fiscal year was 823. Since we are implementing in January 1, it's only 19 of the 26 pay periods, and so that is why um, the actual budget amendment is, is going to be less than the actual AM um, plan cost here. Um, so as, as a wrap-up, um, like I said, we, the, the um, adoption of the pay plan and the structure um, will be accomplished with the adoption of this budget amendment tonight. This will be effective on 1226, which is the beginning of the pay period with a pay date of January the 15th. Um, so if this is adopted tonight, this will go into effect and all the employees will see that increase on the January 15th, 21 paycheck. Once this plan is implemented, then going forward each year, ne ne next year and, and thereafter, um, we will have, like I said, a merit-based system for performance. Um, and so that employees can move within this, this pay plan. I know we had talked about a little bit um, in the last meeting um, going forward, some items that y'all might want to, to address. 
um, you know, an, an increase in the, the minimum wage again uh, incrementally over time. And so um, as we move through the budget process next year, those will be things that we'll be coming back to you um, and, and presenting even further things that we can do to enhance this pay plan as it's, as it's um, adopted. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. Uh, let's start with Jay. Um, I guess my primary question is when, when, you know, assuming that this plan is implemented, um, when it is implemented, will people who are, or who are sort of currently tenured be receiving sort of a, an equal percentage or an equal amount pay raise as compared to those who would be starting so, um, so the way, position. right. So the way that the, the this is structured is we are transitioning people from their current base pay and their step pay. So we're combining that, and then we are moving them into the new pay system on a level that guarantees them. I think we we talked about this the last time. The five hundred dollar overall as, budgetary increase. Minimum, yeah. So basically, what we're doing is we are getting everybody to market minimum plus the 500 if that's if that's what it takes to get them there. So yes, you're gonna have some tenure issues. Now the only areas that that is, that is addressed is in firefighters and police officers. Um, we, did, um, we did have a, a implementation plan based on years of service so that you don't have um, that issue in those particular two areas. Citywide, you, we, we didn't want compression where you had a brand new police officer and a 30-year police officer at the same level. And so because our police officers were significantly under, under the market minimum, that was what was going to happen. And so what, there, are, there are positions across the city that that is going to be an issue. Um, and that's one of those things that, you know, I think we've, we've had a lot of really good um, feedback from, from employees that are very excited about this. Um, that is a concern, um, but the, the thing that this, the beauty of this process in this plan is that most of those people are maxed out at their 10 years or their 12 or 14 or 15. There's no hope right now for more yeah. money. Th With this, this plan, there the is. To, right, to right, move up from there. right. And, the, and yeah, so, that, mm -hmm. I, I understand that's yeah. going to be a little bit of a teething yeah. issue. Yeah, it is, yeah. it is. Um, it was just what we, what we could afford to start and then those will be issues that we can address as we go forward in, with the plan. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. No question. Yard. Pam, how close are we to having the full <coughs> merit-based uh, scale set up for every department where it's based on KPIs or performance? I, mean, I appreciate that as a massive undertaking. Well, Is that something we're pretty close on or we have uh, the rough idea of it I, and we're going to directly Stephen, put that in? Or? I'm going to let Stephen address that since that, that's an HR issue. Hello, Garth. Hey. Uh, yes, I, I've already reached out to a consultant that we're going to look to come in and, and, uh, and talk to us and help us uh, prepare, put these plans together. Um, and it's going to be different for each department. I mean, uh, one of the things that public safety has looked at, police and fire, they would like to get a lot together with the consultant and kind of work out how that's going to be. Um, for their departments, but um, it, yes, starting stages are, are already starting now. Those conversations are begin. Um, getting on the phone with the consultant who has ex past experience in this, and kind of we're we're starting from the beginning of this um, with the pay plan, if adopted or not, and getting everything set in place. Um, so we're ready for that um, for next budget year. Awesome, it, it's a big undertaking. I appreciate that. I, I was I'm glad you brought in the consultant for that. Not that we've We've got about 50 consultants coming in now, but gosh, that is a huge ordeal. So yeah, I, yeah. I appreciate what you've got on your plate, <clears throat> and I'm grateful we can have some some help there because doing this well, the merit-based uh, pay will be fantastic. I think. Yes, sir. It it is new to us, and it's going to be a learning process, and uh, we're looking forward for that uh, next step. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, okay, so if there are no further questions. Uh, for Pam, then the chair would entertain a, a motion to a, adopt the proposed uh, plan. Well, I'll make the motion to adopt adoption of the proposed compensation plan and budget amendment for the 19 pay periods in the current fiscal year impacted by the salary adjustments. I'll second that. Okay. 
Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we consider adoption of the proposed, that we adopt the proposed compensation plan and budget amendments for the 19 pay periods in the current fiscal year impacted by the salary adjustments. Uh, if no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And now you may come back and talk about agenda item D. Before I do that, I, I want to thank you all very much for that um, adoption of that um, pay plan. I think every, um, I speak, I know I speak for every employee here. It is very, very much appreciated and we are excited and I hope that you see um, even more out of, out of your employees because I think, I think this is going to be a, a, um, a great thing for the employees and I think they're going to value it and I think you will see a difference um, in, in the output of work, I hope. So thank you very much. Um, on the next item, um, this is a request from Natchitoches Independent School District um, for a allocation of $100,000 to assist them with some technology expenditures that they had earlier this year due to COVID. Um, this is an item that um, the Texas Education Agency actually made a, an effort to um, assist all the ISDs across the state in, um, in presenting a, a proposal to both cities and counties around the state in order to utilize some of the CARES funds that the, that the governments received in order to assist these ISDs with this extremely expensive um, proposal. Um, this is an item that, of course, um, is definitely something that, that is um, allocated under the, the CARES Act funding. Now, uh, keep in mind that the city of Nacogdoches, we far exceeded our $1.8 million allocation with um, public safety salaries alone. And so um, that is exactly what we submitted to um, the Texas Division of Emergency Management for reimbursement was fire and police um, salaries. And so that money is that, those were our expenditures. So those funds, once we receive them, um, can be utilized um, in, in such a way that the, that the city council so provides. So um, this of course is something that is, is um, probably an extremely necessary item for, for the ISDs. I'm not sure if you, if you had a chance to really kind of look at what the, what the uh, TEA had proposed, but um, they basically were able to, to buy millions of dollars worth of, of laptops and Wi-Fi units so that their, the school district could go to a virtual um, <coughs> situation. Um, I, I'm afraid we're not out of that woods yet. I feel like we're going to be going back virtual at some point. They have the equipment now to do that. And so uh, I know the city was instrumental in, in um, helping them get Dragon Connected set up and, and y'all y'all um, agreed to, to allow us to do some, some um, Wi-Fi points for them and, and spend some of that money. This is just an additional item that, that they need to help offset the cost of some of those unfunded um, items that they had to have. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, Mr. Bolden? Uh, no question. I, I mean, reading everything I've about the school district, et cetera, is something that's needed. So Absolutely. I have no issue with that. Yeah, I agree. Um, Garth, do you have any questions? Similar. No, no questions. Thank you. And Jay? Uh, no particular questions. I know, I know you know, $100,000 sounds like a lot of money, but that is a drop in the bucket for what it has cost yeah. this school district and, and all the others to, to make this happen. So I'm very much in favor of giving them that, that little bit of help. Okay. So the chair would entertain a motion for the uh, approval of that expenditure. Well, I'll move that we approve agenda item 9, what is that, D, um, as written. Okay. All second. Moved and seconded. We approve agenda item number 9D as written. Uh, if no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Pam. Uh, e, consider an ordinance of the city of Nacogdoches for conveyance of land. Jeff Davis. I'm not going to read that whole thing. <laughs> more time than you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I am Jeff Davis, City Attorney. 
Um, agenda item 9E before you at this time uh, marks the successful completion of a 20-year economic development um, project that is now, uh, is now close to completion. Uh, just a very brief history, back in the mid-90s, uh, the city entered into a, uh, an agreement with the state uh, for a Texas Capital Fund contract. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of that contract was to further economic development in order to uh, retain and expand job opportunities in the city of Nacogdoches and the Nacogdoches area. Um, as a result of that, in 1997, uh, the city and Pilgrim's Pride Corporation entered into what was known as or is known as a community and business agreement for real estate improvements. And the purpose was of, of that agreement was to assist Pilgrim's Pride uh, in the construction of improvements at their facility using those Texas Capital Fund uh, monies through that contract that we had with the state. Um, interestingly enough, and I don't know if you realize uh, have realized this, but the city, um, you have owned 0.212 acres in the middle of the complex here at the Pilgrim's Pride plant um, here in Nacogdoches. Uh, the purpose for that was under that agreement that was entered into in 1997 with Pilgrim's Pride for the expansion of their facilities, uh, creating additional job opportunities. And there was constructed on that uh, two-tenths of an acre uh, what is known as a spiral freezer, and I have absolutely no idea what a spiral freezer looks like, does, or is, but, but we constructed one. Uh, the cost of that was somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.6 million. Uh, that was satisfied or that was paid for um, by a grant of $1.45 million from this ta Texas Capital Fund uh, program. And so that was completed in 2000. At that time, the city owned that uh, two-tenths of an acre uh, upon which the spiral freezer was, was constructed, and so the city uh, entered into another agreement with Pilgrim's Pride, and it was a lease and grant repayment agreement. Now, that agreement uh, was for 20 years. Uh, we entered into that back in 2000, and uh, the various provisions of that provided that Pilgrims would make monthly payments to the city of Nacogdoches in the amount of $6,041.67. Uh, the city received those monies, and then we promptly turned around every month, and then we, we uh, remitted that to the state uh, to satisfy that grant. And so, lo, these 240 months, that has taken place religiously. Um, I would be remiss if I did not... Uh, recognize or say a quick word of thanks to Pam Kerbo and the finance um, uh, department. Her, her department has done a fantastic job of administering this every month for the last 20 years, accounting for every penny of that. So under that agreement, that lease agreement and grant repayment agreement with Pilgrim's Pride, upon uh, the final payment, after 240 of these payments, if Pilgrim's uh, made exercised an option for repurchase and provided proper notice to the city, then they were entitled to to repurchase this two-tenths of an acre. Um, and they uh, could do that for the $1.45 million, uh, but it was an eroding thing. So if they satisfied all those payments, then, then at the end of the day, it came to $1,450,000 even. Um, and under that, then we would reconvey under a special warranty deed that, that property back to Pilgrims, thus satisfying the program. Um, there were things that had to be checked. Ms. Carbo and her department did a wonderful job of that. Um, and in uh, satisfaction of this, it, they, they realized that there was $2.40 shy of making the $1.45 million, and that is because over the last 20 years, there was a little accounting area error by Pilgrims and they paid one penny less than they were supposed to pay. So that's where the $2.40 came from. Pam and her folks got all that uh, lined out. Pilgrims wrote a check for $2.40, and so now we are complete. Um, and, and, and that's a wonderful thing, and it has been a great benefit for our community and, and provided additional job opportunities. So it's been very successful. Um, what you have before you at this time is um, an actual ordinance. 
Um, and we have an ordinance for the conveyance of this because the Texas Local Code says that's how we're supposed to go about such things. So um, if approved tonight, the ordinance would authorize the mayor uh, to execute the necessary documentation to reconvey the two-tenths of an acre back to Pilgrim's Pride, and that would be in the form of a special party deed. Mayor, that would conclude my presentation. I'll, uh, well. I'll certainly set, step aside if there's any comments to be made, and I'll answer any questions to the best of my abilities afterwards. Sure. Uh, Garth, let's start with you. Do you have any questions? No, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jay? No, no questions. Thank you. And Roy? No questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. So now uh, we'll entertain a motion uh, to consider this ordinance for approval. Oh, uh, this is item, agenda item 90. Yes, sir. I, I make a motion to approve the ordinance of the city of Nacogdoches for the conveyance of 0 0.212 acres of land, more or less, to Pilgrim Pride Corporation, authorizing the mayor to execute necessary documents of conveyance. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded that we, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, agenda item 90. Again, okay. And um, if there's no further discussion, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 And, no, and any opposed, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So it is now 7.29 p.m. And according to Texas Government Code Section 551-074, council will be going into executive uh, session. job they've done with the salary surveys one person um, you know there there are three people that are are hired by the council and and that is uh, the city manager city attorney and our municipal court judge and uh, the municipal court judge Heather Watts uh, has been here about a year and a half she's the first lawyer that we have had in that position and uh, she came in to, to uh, a system that was functional, but everything was not being done uh, correctly. And so that is, and thank goodness, because we had a lawyer that saw that and was able to, to address it. Now, Heather was not included on that salary survey. She has also been working two jobs this year and a half. She is the municipal court judge, and she has also been serving as the administrative, what's it called, administrative clerk? Or the court administrator. Court administrator, court administrator which has worked well um, because of, of how things have been this year. Now, because they've been doing virtual, a lot of uh, their business virtually, and they will be able to continue to do that, and so there is possibly not the need to, to hire that extra person, and she is capable of doing those positions. So um, I have been talking with her and trying to work with her about um, trying to come to some, uh, an agreement about a satisfactory salary and with some assistance from uh, Stephen and Mario and Jeff. And so currently she has paid $54,000, which is just amazing to me that we have been able to get away with that for, for this <laughs> long. But um, what I would like for you uh, to know is that um, 
I really think she deserves, she's doing the job of, of what two people used to do, even though it's been, um, things have been um, changed up a little bit uh, so that it works more, more easily and succinctly. She has developed processes. They are in place. She has two clerks right now. There's another one that is supposed to be hired. And what I would like to do is increase her salary and then have uh, a list of expectations that she will be required to report to council on at least an annual basis. And she and I went over all of those, and I, t and I shared with her that I would be um, talking to you all about them. And so some of those um, <coughs> would be to continue to review the operations, procedures, and processes and, uh, that she has set up and the improvements that she's made and make certain that they are implemented. Uh, she will create a hierarchy of her staff. She will um, also work a little bit closer with our city manager, uh, the new, of course, our law firm that's coming in, but the new city attorney, and with executive staff because they all can really help each other in a lot of areas, and I think she could uh, benefit from that. So you remember last time we had uh, the grade of salaries, and there's a grade 35 that had the assistant public works director and assistant director of finance, and then under that is a grade 34 where there is no one, and the next grade is 33, which, which is our assistant community services director. So I would propose that we put her at grade 34 with a salary of, that comes out to 81207 annually. And I also did not mention that she, uh, she collected some of the information, but, and Stephen did a salary survey for the position she's doing. And they had to do that because this is, of course, we're very unique in Nacogdoches. Um, and uh, so a lot of these uh, jobs were combined from some places. So any of uh, the four of us are open to answer any questions you might have. Let's see, we started with Jay last time. Mr. Bolden. Oh, um, that's 81207 That's a base salary for other locations that's performing the same task. Well, okay, so you have to look at, it's, it, it is, um, it is a, yes, it is a good base salary. Base. It, it is a little bit above, you know, um, what the bottom would be. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that has that actual job in our region. Okay. Okay, because of, of the way things are set mm -hmm. up, and so it's sort of a, a combination of, of, of jobs. She's also an attorney, an experienced attorney, and so that is something that, you know, you also take into an, to an account. And so if she starts at that grade 35, she's not starting at the bottom of grade 35, I mean 34, I'm sorry. She is a little bit above that minimum start because of her uh, experience. And, and she now, was, is that experience in municipal court? Um, did she do that in St. Augustine? She didn't do. She 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 has a great deal of experience in that level of court. Yeah. Um, she was, I believe, twice elected county attorney in St. Augustine County, uh, Councilman Mary Bolden, and, and so, although she's not prior to being appointed as municipal judge, then mm -hmm. municipal judge, she was with that level of court. She has a lot of experience in, in working with those courts. Being a county uh, attorney. Oh, okay. Right. No, man, I retract my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Garth? Garth, do you have any questions? Yeah, sorry. It was muted on me there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, of the different positions that she's currently taking on, is it going to stay that way? Or when we begin opening back up, will we need to hire someone else? Uh, someone else like so so she's got her current role that's defined in our job description then she's absorbed that second role is she gonna uh, whatever the 
inverse of absorb. Is she gonna push that back out if right. we get busy again? That's so. That was my main concern also. So there, there is a job opening right now for another clerk position, and the idea that um, uh, I believe Mario had was to hire someone who could be sort of the lead clerk and could take some so that it develops a hierarchy at the office. But um, no, the way she has streamlined it, she can manage both of those roles. And it's good because she's, being an attorney, she has been able to catch a lot of things uh, that I think previously had slid through the cracks. So, I, I think the only other two sniff tests I'd, I'd throw out are, um, is it valuable? Like, should we want to have an attorney in that role? And should we pay for that? degree and that experience? Like, is it, is it that relevant? Um, and then secondly, uh, if we needed to go out and hire this right now, like, do we, what would we need to pay? Like, let's put, let's put her aside and, and, and take that hat off and just fill a bucket, fill a, fill a box on an uh, org chart as an example for someone to do all the tasks. Like, are we talking about an $80,000 $80, job or a $50,000 job realistically? Right, so you'd have to have a full-time court administrator, and then you'd probably have a part-time municipal judge, and right, and so the I want to make sure I'm speaking correctly, and so the court administrators um, looks like make what is the average for that sixty, and the part-time. Let's see. Judge part time make about oh my goodness a hundred. <clears throat> that looks like the average a hundred thousand. So what do you see, Stephen? The dark that dark bar is a hundred thousand. Yeah, <clears throat> just just real quick, I I um yeah I focused on this sheet um if you, if you have oh, that okay. in your packet okay and so I it's do. it's. Uh, council member hand it's really across the board on how they pay um, based on the part-time full-time contract some of the part-times work eight hours a week some of them work 20 hours a week but I mean it the even a part-timer I think the the lowest salary um, was in Marshall as a part-timer of $35,000 a year and it just went up from there um, and so I think what uh, mayor was saying is that looking at you know just the court administrator I think the average came out around sixty thousand dollars plus the thirty five you're in the eighty thousand dollar mark there probably just to get started with bringing that in um, as a court administrator and a part-time judge so. and Stephen like when, when you look at these positions are is this is this typically filled by a an actual attorney or is it more often than not it's not an attorney I think having the attorney um, is a big asset. It, it does not have to be an attorney, uh, but a, a lot of cities, especially once they start getting uh, larger than us, are, are, I don't know the exact, but uh, probably it's more common for it to be an attorney and probably would recommend having an attorney, especially if you went to part-time or something Thanks like that. So. Let's let Jeff weigh in on that real yeah, quick. The, the, both those are, are fantastic questions, Garth. The, <coughs> You know, 20 some odd years ago when I started, uh, you know, dealing with JP courts, justice courts, or, or municipal courts, uh, it was very common that you did not have an attorney as the, as the judge. I can say that over the, those years, particularly the last five, 10 to five years, it has really changed. The responsibilities are much more, the expectations are much more. Um, with regard to things such as discovery, you know, before judges at that level didn't have to deal with discovery issues. Now it's mandated uh, changes in the law. Uh, with regard to the complexity of, of motions filed, there's some really unusual ones filed. Um, I, it is, I think that it is a tremendous move, and I appreciate the council very much appointing a licensed attorney and that's certainly no knock on judge springer she did a beautiful job for many years but it's just changed the bottom line has just changed and i'll say this that um, the liabilities that uh, those courts and cities take on now 
um, or, or that, that can be faced with, it has changed. And so with re without getting too far down in the weeds, with Judge Watts coming in and looking at those systems, there have been tremendous efficiencies that she has created. There are tremendous, um, I'll just say issues. I don't know how else to say it any better. That's about as soft as I can put it. Issues that she has corrected that could have been tremendous liabilities for the city. Um, with regard to the administration of justice, when it comes to issuing uh, issuance of the capuses, the warrants, entering these things into the state system, she has remedied, if I said thousands of cases, that would probably not touch it. Um, so, and the way she conducts herself on the bench um, with, uh, you know, with pro se litigants, with people that represent themselves, but also uh, dealing with attorneys is just a different level. And the, the level of justice being administered, I think, is a whole different level. Um, she's very good with people. She's very good on the bench. She is very good at knowing when to be, uh, you know, when to crack the gavel and when to, to show mercy. Um, and I think that those are some things that just come with the experience and with being a licensed attorney. I'll give you one more example, is that just recently um, there's there are what are known as scoff laws. So essentially somebody runs off, doesn't take care of a ticket. Uh, there are traditionally some things that could be done that, that you have to be exceedingly careful with now or you can find yourself in, in litigation in a federal court. And so uh, these scoff laws are ways to block people from, from getting their renewing a license or registering a vehicle. Well, the, the license, getting their license portion, we're in the game on that, but that's every, what, seven years. Um, so you get some some fella that you know gets two speeding tickets and a registration ticket and he blows that off thinking well I'll just deal with it in seven years with some of these scoff laws if probably done every year when they try to register their vehicle they're blocked from doing that if it's properly in place well she made inquiry about do we have these scoff laws properly in place to which the response was oh yeah yeah we do yeah we do by the the staff she had at that time well she didn't leave it alone she went back and she dug and dug and she found sure enough there's a contract in a folder down there it's not executed and so mm -hmm. just that one thing and having the sophistication to understand that has to be executed and how it actually works really works that that one thing alone will generate and it's not a quarter revenue but revenue is a byproduct, it, that one thing will generate hundreds of thousands of dollars. Plus it'll bring people to the table to take care of their, their responsibilities to the city and the justice system. So it, it's just a, it's a different day. And I think cities of our size and larger are really just operating almost at their peril now if they don't have a licensed attorney. That's, that's really good feedback. I, I appreciate that. I, I wasn't trying to be picky, but just trying to figure out, are, are we paying uh, paying an attorney to be a trash truck driver, as an example? I mean, just trying to figure out like how, how critical, how important is that? And it sounds like it's super important, in addition to her bringing uh, some structural and um, reorg that it has been really fruitful. So I, I, I didn't mean to pepper you guys with questions, but that's, that's good to know. No, and, and actually the efficiencies, and if you put all that aside and just look at the efficiencies, if you go apples to apples, not apples to oranges, even though there's, you know, 50, 60% decrease in, in case filings this year, still four or 5,000, her efficiency rate, if you look at the sheer just numbers and, and her efficiencies with those numbers are greater than in the past. Plus, we have the proper systems in place. And so it's, it's you know, it, I, I, Garth, you know, in, I guess in a perfect world, it's a blank slate. You know, do you go hire a, a, a court coordinator, um, you know, administrator for 60000 or sixty five? get somebody really worth their salt? Yeah. Um, then go out and hire a part-time lawyer to be the judge? Yes, that, that, that would be a good way to do it. But you're probably combined looking at what, you know, 100 and... You know, you're you're looking at well north of a hundred, um, and and uh, so it, it's probably a although it's a, a, a quite the increase I think for the quality of of the court administration of justice, the efficiencies, the the taking away of the liabilities, um, it's probably a pretty good bang for the buck. 
Sounds like a heck of a deal to me. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Garth? No, ma'am. Okay. Did I check with you? Um, am I correct in thinking that David Adams was the last attorney that we had as he, he, as, he was, and um, so court judge. Oh. absolutely, Jay, great, yeah. very good memory. My, my, my mom worked with him. So. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and uh, um, you know, David had been the district attorney here for 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 some time. He was a very experienced Judge Adams, uh, but he was part time. Yeah. Um, yeah, or he he. He had a court coordinator, and he was not there all the time. Right. And that's that. No, I think I, that was the arrangement. But no, you're right. I, I, that was merely out of curiosity. And, and while I, I'm sure he would be horrified by these numbers, it sounds like a very, <laughs> very, very fair amount for us to, to compensate Miss Watts um, for for doing what she does. Absolutely. So, it, when we, if we are in agreement on this, and we make a motion, do we say that number? Or do we say grade? I mean, can we grade say a grade 34? I would say grade 34. Grade 34, okay. And then the other thing would be, when we make the motion, um, to, because the way this is written in the executive set, in the agenda, it says job description. So we could, because we have been talking about the job description, you could allow the mayor and um, city manager, city attorney, and HR director to develop that job description. Do you have another suggestion, Marion? Yeah, I think there, I think there is, and we, you know, she is. Um, but we she, wanted to have some checks. We wanted right, to have these right. things put in so, there. So there may be, and I if I go back and look, the job description is kind of set because she is the, she is, you know, an independent um, member of the judiciary, you know, I mean, it is, a, it is, a, it's a real court, and so that's description to set. Um, I know that she's performing these additional duties of coordinator or administrator. Um, so it, then we should have called it expectations to counsel because she and I did go over those in pretty great detail, and she was amenable to do that. Right. So, so I, I think you can, you know, again. Or do we I, even have to mention it since we have. You really regards. don't, but I mean. Okay. Uh, but, but that's one of those things that, I mean, just as part of a course, they're one of your appointees. You have, should certainly have the option uh, to bring your appointee on an occasional basis to do a review. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just part of an annual process. And maybe it's one of those things is that you, you set a, a grade 34 along with a a, uh, a, a uh, uh, discussion with the city with the city uh, municipal court judge for a uh, uh, future review um, something to that effect but you don't have to you, say you, that. you could so so with regard very good point mayor with regard to discuss the compensation and job description of municipal judge that is for executive session so that doesn't mean you have to take come out and take action on both of those or any of those. If you came out and simply took action um, to set the compensation of the municipal court judge, you know, in, in the 34, you know, right. category range, right. then, then that would do it. Uh, you know, okay. you, well, you, 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 you've got the authority to, to have reviews if we set it at that, are we setting that precedent in perpetuity? Or are we just doing that for her? I, I don't think that you're given, given, the, given the additional um, tests that co she's handling. Co completely super questioned, and it kind of falls into what Garth was saying. You know, okay, you know, once we plow this ground, is it plowed this way forever? And I, th I think the answer, I th my my recommendation is is henceforth always have a, an attorney in that position. However, I don't think you're married now going forward in perpetuity with having a full-time judge who's performing the, the coordination administrative duties. Right. And so right. at some point, if, if Judge Watts decided to take her practice in a different area or a part of the ways, however that might happen, and you wanted to go back and hire a full-time coordinator and then hire a, a, a part-time part attorney I don't think there'd be any problem with that, with that whatsoever. Okay.
so so we can we can separate the two positions again. Absolutely, and I'll I'll, I'll say this that there are a number of places that have a separation. Mm -hmm. um, there there's others that don't. There does need to be a line in the sand though between the clerk positions and and the judge position. Yeah. And and yeah, and those absolutely. two should not cross because you get into ex parte situations where litigants then are, are having ex parte communication with the judge. And mm -hmm. so the, the literature, at least what I've read up on, is that's a clear line in the sand. Mm -hmm. She can perform these others. In a perfect world, I guess you've got, you know, different people for different functions. But she can perform those and those are part of the, the, the judicial function, but those clerk duties need to be separate. She does right, not need right. to step. She can supervise those folks, but she doesn't need to step over and perform those duties. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anything else anyone want to bring up before we? And, I'll, and I can, I'll go ahead and make that motion once we get back to executive session. Is anybody left out here that wants to? I don't know that anybody else is here. And it is what, 754. Take someone awfully dedicated to study here at the moment. Oh, meaning for everything? <laughs> oh, yeah. This, Uh, we are back from executive session. Uh, according to uh, Texas Government Code Section 551-074, it is still December 15th, 2020. It is 7.54 p.m. Um, and I will make a motion to set the compensation for our municipal court judge at grade 34. I'll second. I'll second. Okay, got three seconds. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Uh, so moved and seconded, and if there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. That concludes our meeting for December 15, 2020, and uh, thank you all for attending. I also wanted to second, I am oh, second.